Masters from Roosevelt University. All right, this is Rasme. She is a year two pharmacy student. Since the pandemic started, she has incorporated many indoor plants into her apartment since she loves plants. She is currently the operation immunization chair and soon to be president of the American Public Health Association. She is interested in patient care and has been thinking of participating in residency. She hopes to be able to work as an ambulatory care pharmacist or in veterinary medicine in the future. And she hopes to work with animals and medicine. Next, we have Chelsea, who is a year three pharmacy student with just one more term before her advanced pharmacy practice experiences rotation. She is interested in working at a pharmaceutical company after graduation, but is still open to other opportunities. This past year, she has been doing research with an infectious disease professor with a published article about COVID-19, and she is working on a study about antibiotics, which she is doing data collection on. Moving on, we have Jessica Young, who is a year three pharmacy student. She is the current president of the American Society for Public Administration and the current Pediatric Pharmacy Association Secretary. Her main career goal is to become a pediatric pharmacist. And lastly, we have Polina, who is a year two pharmacy student. In her undergrad, she was a chemistry and writing tutor for years and was involved in research in her undergrad using PCR DNA sequencing of various plants. Currently, she is working at Walgreens as a part-time pharmacy intern while being involved in several student organizations as well, in addition to balancing school. At this time, she is not entirely sure what aspect of pharmacy she would like to pursue, but research has always been something she has been interested in along with clinical work. The name of the presentation today is the Roosevelt University Student Pharmacists Present the Scope of Pharmacy, Career and COVID-19. Sorry, I couldn't figure out how to unmute because we're not used to this system. <laughs> um, Paulina, are you able to unmute? I know she's starting off the presentation for us. I think she's figuring that out as well. Yeah, can you guys hear me? <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for everyone who um, who's attending today or um, watching this recorded. And thank you for Harper College for allowing us to present this presentation today. So um, what we're basically gonna be presenting on today is a little bit about Roosevelt University College of Pharmacy program, as well as COVID-19 since it is a big issue today. So what is the pharmacist's role? So um, the way that you might think of a pharmacist role is typically of dispensing medications and that kind of thing. However, pharmacists are much more involved in the healthcare field. Um, in the healthcare field, so one of the things that pharmacists do is uh, we participate in patient care. Um, we do medication reconciliation. We also look at drug drug interactions just to see how the body reacts and how other drugs can react to each other, just to make sure that the medications patients are taking are safe for them and are effective dose as well for their condition. And typically, when you think of a pharmacist, you think of um, the retail aspect of it, such as CVS, Walgreens, or other retail stores. But there are other aspects of pharmacy you could pursue, like hospital pharmacy, uh, long-term care pharmacy, and industry pharmacy. You can click the next one. All right, um, so at Roosevelt University here, we offer a three year PharmD program. It is an accelerated program, which means you will have school year round. And so with the three year pharmacy, you do not need any type of um, certification or a bachelor degree, associate's degree. You do not need any of that as long as you um, complete the prerequisite courses. Um, and you can apply for this program. Usually any pharmacy program, you can apply on FarmCast with a PCAT. A lot of schools are um, about 
um, are more lenient with the PCAT nowadays because of COVID. So it's depending on the school now if the school requires the PCAT score or not. Usually it'll also request for essays and letters of recommendation as well. And next slide, please. Okay. So here are the prerequisite courses um, for Roosevelt University. These courses consist of basically general chemistry, organic chemistry. Um, so that's four semester total just for chemistry, two semester of biology, um, I, um, and then anatomy, physiology, some calculus, one class of physics, two semesters of English, a speech class, economics, and uh, one elective. So with these prereq, I actually completed all of my prerequisite at Harper. So if anyone is interested in transferring over to a pharmacy program, um, you can go ahead and contact me. I can help you out with that to see what classes to take. And next slide, please. So um, at Roosevelt, uh, we are currently um, online learning um, just because of the current situation, but um, before COVID had started, we were um, in person. And so we are smaller class size than other pharmacy schools in the area. We um, typically have an average of 70 students per class and um, all of your classmates will take all your classes together. Um, and so this way you have closer connections with your professor. And the goal is that everyone um, knows everyone in your class and uh, within the college. So you can use them as um, resources as you would out in the real world. So we also have um, different organizations um, that you can get involved with. Um, for example, um, the organization helping us today um, is American Pharmacy Association, um, but there are plenty of other ones determine, um, determining what you have interest in, or interest in and what would help further your career in pharmacy. And then something that um, all pharmacy students get to experience are rotations. And this will give you experience out in the real world um, in pharmacy. So it could be anything from your community pharmacies, um, which is typically like your retail pharmacy or um, some rotations out in hospital settings. Um, but there are various rotations and in your advanced rotations, you get to choose. Um, you have more of an ability to choose what you are interested in and get rotations um, that interest you. So um, during this time um, with COVID, pharmacists have been very involved in um, patient health um, and the overall uh, COVID environment. So some things that we as even pharmacy students have been doing um, are immunization. So giving out the COVID vaccines that are rotations, um, and counseling patients on what kinds of things to expect with the vaccine, as well as um, the signs and symptoms of COVID itself. Um, personally, at my rotation that I'm currently um, doing right now, I give about 40 uh, COVID vaccines a day, and then we also offer COVID testing at our site. So these are different things that you get to experience as a pharmacist. All right, so we'll go ahead and talk about vaccinations now and um, we'll just switch gears a little bit and Dr. Daly, if you can proceed to the next slide, please. Okay, so the question is, um, what is immunity and how do we build it? So immunity is, um, uh, you can proceed to where all the information would come out. Sorry. Here we go. Okay, so what is immunity and how do we build it? Immunity is um, our response. Um, so our body responds to foreign substance. There are two types of immunity, which is innate and adaptive. Um, innate immunity actually comes um, with us since birth and adaptive is when the body makes memory cells and remember it the next time when we come in contact with that same foreign substance. So, um, when our body notices a foreign substance, our immune system actually attacks the foreign um, system, the, the foreign object, so that the body um, protects us from that. And this can be a quick response throughout innate immunity, or it could be a latent response through our adaptive immunity. So, 
To build the latent response, all immune system actually needs to first be introduced to this um, foreign foreign body um, after the after the foreign body is introduced to um, our body. I'm sorry. After the foreign substance is introduced to our body, um, our white blood cells actually keep a memory um, of this foreign body for the future um, reference. So when we come in contact with it again, we're able to make a quick response um, to encounter that foreign, foreign substance again. So um, the question is, how can we spread, how can we speed up this process? And the answer to that is vaccination. Next slide, please. And you can, yep, there we go. So coronavirus isn't necessarily new. It has been identified um, since the 1960s with four different subtypes. And um, those subtypes you would typically see um, such as a common cold in human. And identification of the SARS-CoV in 2003 was found mm -hmm. to cause the um, infection of child su suffering from conjunctivitis and fever. And as well as um, it was found in 2013 um, when a man was admitted to the hospital that was infected with mers cov So COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, however, is a new identified virus from the coronavirus family that can cause an acute lung infection. Next slide, please. Okay, so where did this um, virus all started. And then you can, yep. Okay, so the first case was found in Wuhan, China. Epidemiologists have discovered and determined that the virus um, was most likely came from an animal that was sold in um, one of the market in Wuhan. And the virus was found to be closely, closely related to SARS-CoV. So this was named SARS-CoV-2. And with all of, um, with all of this first, when, all of this first began, it started as an ep um, epidemic in Wuhan and was soon to be classified as a pandemic um, in March of 2020. So the difference between an epidemic and pandemic, you may ask. Um, so an epidemic is a sudden increase in cases of a disease in a certain region of the world, um, whereas a pandemic is an event in which the disease spread across several countries and affect a large number of um, people. Next slide, please. That's just reiterating the epidemic and pandemic. Okay, so um, this, um, this data, I actually took it um, on Sunday from the CDC. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I took this data from the CDC as of May 2nd on May 2nd, 2021. It was on uh, Sunday. So the total case in the United States is now at 32 million and the total deaths of 573,000 um, and total vaccinated is 20, uh, 246 million. And if you look at the graph, since we started vaccinating people, the um, number of cases have decreased immensely. Next slide, please. All right, so here are the, um, some signs and symptoms of COVID-19. So it would be fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath, um, difficulty breathing, fatigue, muscle and body aches, um, headaches, and the main one is the new loss of taste or smell. You can get sore throat, congestion and runny nose, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So we would like to point out the differences on um, what you would see in a flu symptom. So with flu symptoms, you will not see like loss of smells or taste. So that's how you can differentiate if you have COVID or flu. And now that it's allergy season, um, you can also see that with allergies, you will not like usually you don't get a fever or body ache. So that's Another difference is that you can differentiate between COVID symptoms and allergy. And also just to keep in mind that a lot of people actually have COVID, they did not experience any symptoms at all. So you can walk around without knowing that you have COVID. All right, next slide. So some ways to prevent the spread of COVID would be to wash your hands regularly with soap and water for about 20 seconds. Um, you want to stay home if you are feeling sick 
and uh, most important is wearing a properly uh, fitted face mask. You're going to also want to make sure you stay six feet away from others and avoid crowded places. Um, and you're also going to want to make sure that you clean and disinfect any frequently touched objects and avoid um, touching that op a dirty object um, in, near your eyes or your nose or your mouth. And then um, if you are eligible, you want to make sure that you vaccinate um, against COVID-19. So the first few um, items here when like you're washing your hands and then staying home when you're feeling sick, that these can apply to all sicknesses in general. You're going to want to remember to wash your hands um, every day anyway to prevent any uh, real illnesses. So all Illinois residents the ages of 16 years or older are eligible to receive the vaccine and this um, began April 12th. Um, and then the Pfizer vaccine is the only um, currently approved uh, vaccine for those who are over the age of 16. So for those um, of you in your families or um, relatives, things that you know, you wanna make sure that they are receiving the Pfizer if they are um, 16. So here are some local sites near Harper that you can um, visit to actually get your vaccination. So you can go to your local pharmacies, your Walgreens, your CVS, um, your Jewel Osco, um, and then at some outpatient sites such as the Alexian Brothers Outpatient um, Clinics, the St. Alexius Outpatient Center, and then any Amita Health Outpatient Clinics. Um, but if you are looking just in general for other locations that might have the vaccine, this website here at the bottom will allow you to just type in your um, zip code and it'll give you all the um, top results of the closest vaccines to you and who actually has vaccines available. All right, so just to go over some of the approved COVID-19 vaccines, as you've probably heard, these are now household names. Um, so we have the Pfizer which is an mRNA, Moderna, which is also mRNA, and J&J, which is a viral vector vaccine. All of these are administered intramuscularly. Um, age restrictions for the Pfizer one is 16 years and older. And currently they're expected to um, authorize a new age limit from, for in the, about a week, I believe. Um, so keep on lookout for that, it should be now at 12 years and older, uh, but that will be updated probably in the next week. Um, Moderna is 18 years and older, and J&J is also 18 years and older. Um, Pfizer, right now we have two dose series administered three weeks apart, and more on that as well, as, as you probably heard, if you keep up with the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, there is a study going on about doing a third dose. Uh, Moderna is a two-dose series administered one month apart, and J&J is one dose. Thank you. Oh, you could go back. Okay, so we see here the efficacy and safety of these vaccines. So Pfizer, we have 95%. 94.5% for Moderna and 66.1% for J&J. &J. Uh, basically, um, this just shows the efficacy of the vaccines. And when we consider these efficacy rates, um, we also have to consider the different time periods, uh, regions, and also uh, the different strains that were tested during these studies to get these efficacy rates. So with the lower efficacy rate that we see with J&J, &J, uh, this does not mean that it's not as effective as the others. Basically, this shows that uh, the 66.1% is, is the effectiveness of fighting against having moderate to severe critical COVID-19. And that is at least 28 days after receiving the vaccine. Um, also, in that study that they did um, to get the 66.1, they also did after the 28 days, it showed that 85.4% efficacy was shown against experiencing severe COVID-19. So the benefits of J&J &J is that it is, it is easily distributed. It doesn't have as stringent storage control as Pfizer and Moderna uh, because Pfizer, um, they do require stricter freezing levels. 
um, be stored. And um, there is better adherence in getting the J and J vaccine because of having just the one dose. Uh, so it's less worry for physicians and pharmacists to worry about making sure that they come in, come back for their second dose. Um, so in general, this can help us save people uh, people's lives globally. We can go next. So what are the current updates on the J&J vaccine? Um, as you may have heard, um, about a few weeks ago, CDC and FDA released a statement announcing a hold to put on J&J COVID-19 vaccine due to the rare cases of blood clots uh, being reported. Um, so the hold was placed a few weeks ago to review these cases. Basically, uh, what they found were uh, younger women that had received blood, clot, blood clots um, occurring from thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome. Um, basically, these women presented uh, with other risk factors. Um, for example, there's patients with use, that used uh, oral contraceptives uh, who had hypertension and uh, also age to consider. So the whole place to help better understand what could have caused these cases and to be able to give clinicians basically a better understanding on how to screen their patients more precisely when recommending the J&J and what and also what to look out for for better recommendations for future for uh, recommendations for patients to get the J&J in the future. You know, next. And so what's going on now with J&J? So just last week, they lifted the hold. Um, so the overall incidence rate of the thrombocytopenia syndrome found to be 0.00019%. So it is very small. Uh, so it is a rare case. And basically these benefits outweigh the risk. Um, so J&J vaccine could prevent up to 1,400 COVID-19 deaths and as many as 3,500 ICU admissions over six months. Um, oh, okay, you can go next. So some uh, frequently asked questions about the COVID vaccine. Um, is it safe to get the COVID-19 uh, vaccine if you're pregnant or breastfeeding? Um, currently, there are no guidelines saying that you cannot receive the vaccine if you are pregnant or breastfeeding. Um, we are currently uh, undergoing research to determine um, the actual effects. However, um, as usual uh, vaccines work with P uh, women who are pregnant and breastfeeding, um, there is no harm in uh, the vaccine. Is there a risk of severe reactions to the vaccine? Um, so the most common reported side effects for uh, all of the vaccines are um, uh, injection site reactions that could be anywhere from redness um, and muscle soreness at the injection site, which is typical with any vaccine, uh, similar to like the flu vaccine. And um, another reported side effect would be cold or flu-like symptoms, and that could be fever, chills, all over muscle aches. Um, but those have actually been the most commonly reported side effects. And so there actually hasn't been any real true severe reaction, except for um, patients who do receive um, anaphylaxis with uh, injections. How do you report um, these reactions if you do experience a severe problem? So there actually is something that uh, is used for all vaccines, and that would be the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, also known as VAERS. And that is something that is actually available for all vaccinations. And so if you do experience something, you at the pharmacy or wherever you receive your vaccine, you'll receive um, information on how to report that uh, adverse reaction that you experience. If anything, you can also just contact um, your provider or the pharmacist or wherever you receive your vaccine of the um, reaction you do get and they can help uh, fill out the VAERS for you. If a person has had COVID before, do they still need to re receive the vaccine? And the answer is yes. It will only provide you with uh, protection in the future. Um, how about new strains of COVID? Will you be protected against it? And the answer to that is yes. Um, as is with all other vaccines that 
It will provide you protection against um, COVID virus, and it should provide you with protection um, from serious uh, hospitalization or um, well, hospitalization or serious effects from COVID, uh, the COVID infection in general. Um, the last question, how do I know that the vaccine isn't just something being pushed by the government and pharmaceutical companies for their own profits? Well, the vaccine is actually free of charge for everyone. The government is taking care of all costs for that. And so um, with the government uh, initiating um, Operation Warp Speed, they were um, covering all the costs for production and for all the medical research that was going into the vaccine. So it will not affect you as um, a consumer um, and you will not owe the government or pharmaceutical companies anything. Next slide. All right, so as we may have heard from the news, there is a new mask mandate, which we will talk about in the next slide. So per the mask mandate, some rules have changed for those that are unvaccinated, uh, those that are not vaccinated yet versus fully vaccinated. So fully, fully vaccinated people are allowed to wear, um, basically they're allowed to wear no masks um, outside in small gatherings with other fully vaccinated people attend small gatherings with fully and unvaccinated people, dine, um, dine at restaurants that are outdoor and go outdoors um, without wearing a mask. However, for large crowded events, it's still recommended for both unvaccinated, um, sorry, both uh, people that are vaccinated versus not vaccinated to continue to wear their masks and socially distance. And in general, for indoor activities for people that are not vaccinated yet, and for those that are vaccinated, it is still recommended to social distance and wear your masks whenever possible. Next slide, please. And here are some CDC guidelines for those that are fully vaccinated. Um, being fully vaccinated means that it's been at least two weeks since you received your second dose of either the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine or at least two weeks since you received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So per the CDC guidelines, you can visit fully vaccinated individuals without masks or social distancing, visit, uh, visit people that are not vaccinated yet, that are at low risk for contracting severe COVID-19 um, indoors without social distancing, or you can wear a mask as well, depending on if you're comfortable with it. And you can participate still in outdoor activities without a mask, but not in crowded settings, of course. And you can resume domestic travel and refrain from testing before and after travel or self quarantine after travel. And you can refrain from COVID-19 testing before leaving the US as long as the other country doesn't demand it, of course. And you do not have to self quarantine after coming back into the country. And you can refrain from testing if you are exposed to COVID-19, if you are fully vaccinated, as long as you're asymptomatic. And you can refrain from um, quarantining if you are asymptomatic and from routine screening as well, if you do not display any symptoms. Next slide, please. So the question is, how is pharmacy relevant to average working people? And what effects have we seen during the last few years? Next slide, please. So the answer is more accessible healthcare professionals. Each year, pharmacists all over the nation are the driving force for change in better healthcare outcomes in chronic disease management across the world, such as asthma, COPD, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, depression, and so many more. Next slide, please. So for pharmacists, we are natural born leaders. Uh, there's about over 300 pharmacists across the United States providing optimal patient care daily. And this um, statement here is provided by our organization, American Pharmacists Association, uh, basically explaining exactly what we do. So we are more than just counting pills behind the, behind the counter. We make sure that our patients get the right dose, the right drug, um, make sure patients uh, just taking their medications right, um, taking it the right way, and um, basically cater to each of our patients and make sure that 
all their medications are um, without risks. You can go to the next slide. So outlook and innovation within pharmacy. So pharmacy is expanding and now more than ever, especially with this pandemic, with we also have telehealth, mail delivery, automation and specific patient care requests. So as students, we get an early start by participating on, in organizations uh, to advocate for the profession and grow your network circle of highly motivated intellectual leaders within the community. You can go next slide. All right, and some takeaways and some advice. Um, you could, yeah, there you go. Um, so basically, as students, so we want to expect the unexpected and roll with the punches. Obviously, with this pandemic, that is something that any every healthcare provider had to do. Um, and as students, so we also need to start networking with our pharmacy students and pharmacists. So with us on the line presenting this presentation to you, don't hesitate to reach out to us for anything, even if you're not going into pharmacy. Uh, we'll, we'll be happy to answer any questions and also be able to, if you can, or if you're interested, reach out to your pharmacist at your local pharmacy. Uh, I'm pretty sure they'll be happy to answer any questions as well. And creating your own brand and unique name for yourself. So this is basically just saying that uh, find your passion, especially in school and especially all of you trying to uh, find a career. Uh, just make sure that you know that you can uh, be yourself and find your passion and find the route, uh, find the right outlets to um, explore that. And then explore pathways that are out of your comfort zone. So basically just keep an open mind um, for everything. And did you three have anything else to say? Any advice for them as well? I think that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> really just try to reach out if you really have any questions and make those connections with other pharmacists and other students who are pursuing the same thing as you. So somebody had a question in the chat. Um, yeah, Amanda, do you want to, Amanda, do you want to um, take care of the chat questions and then any other questions? Go for it. All right, so just remember, guys, if you have any questions, type it in the chat. Our first question that we have for you, and doesn't matter whichever one of you want to go. All right, has there been any severe side effects with the Pfizer vaccine, like Johnson and Johnson. So there hasn't been any um, reported severe side effects, um, except for just patients who typically experience anaphylaxis with other injections. Um, and like I said earlier, the most commonly reported side effects and things that we've even seen out in um, the pharmacy ourselves is bad injection site um, reactions. So like. Redness around that um, injection site or even muscle soreness and then some cold and flu like symptoms and you can actually just treat those with um, your over the counter um, Tylenol um, that you would regularly take. All right, um, Amina, you want to lead us into the 2nd question? Yeah, so um, 2nd, does the blood type impact the severity of the COVID-19 infection along with. Um, when a person gets vaccinated, does their blood type affect the type of effects they face after the vaccine? I have not, like in terms of study wise and of the COVID vaccine in general, I have not heard anything about, um, you know, the difference, um, of your blood type has anything to do with the COVID vaccine? I'm not sure if that's what you're asking about. I know there were um, like a lot of people saying if they have like, oh, blood type, they don't get like COVID or something like that. I'm not sure if that's the same questions or. Yeah, in this case, I think it would be uh, severity in terms of whether you have type O, type AB, type B, type A. Like in like terms of 
getting COVID, not like the COVID vaccine has any effect on the different blood type, right? Yeah, getting the COVID infection. Okay. Yeah, that's why I was like a bit confused with the question. <laughs> Um, I know as far as they're doing the research with the O blood type, they, um, I have not read much about it, but I can give you an answer back on, um, the effect of it. I know they are trying to do like some studies if, um, the difference blood type would have anything to do with the impact of, um, the COVID infection. I know I heard that people with O blood type, like, doesn't get as severe. But I mean, you could still get COVID. <laughs> All right, we have a third question. What would happen to an individual who got one dose of Pfizer and the second dose of the Moderna vaccination? Would the shots be effective to fight against COVID and would the person feel any negative impacts? Okay, so um, this is a little bit of a tricky uh, question. Um, we have actually had this experience before at my pharmacy. Um, what had happened is um, they received the vaccine of, I believe it was Pfizer first, and then they received the second dose as Moderna. Um, and it is not recommended to get um, one dose of Pfizer and then one dose of Moderna. If it is possible, just stick with one company if that makes sense so make sure if possible get the two doses of either pfizer two doses of moderna or the one dose of johnson and johnson um i have been reading up on some studies and there hasn't been many studies um showing um the effectiveness to fight against covid if one were to uh, get one dose of moderna and one dose of pfizer um i can look into that more to see if there's any more info and get back to you unless if my colleagues have anything else to add yeah that's yes. fairly new to us as well because we just heard that there's been a, a lot of mixing going on at like um some pharmacies where um they would give a certain individual different vaccines because they're carrying two so it gets confusing All right, for the next question, we have, does Roosevelt offer Harper students a cheaper tuition and does Roosevelt offer a funeral directing program? Um, I wouldn't say they offer a cheaper tuition, but um, I know they do have like a certain thing called like a dual program with Roosevelt, but I'm not sure if it's for pharmacy. Um, I think it's for business, if I'm correct. Um, but they do offer a lot of scholarship as well, which is why I chose Roosevelt. And as far, I lost the question. Um, the funeral directing program, I'm actually not familiar with that. Um, I can give you a contact information to a financial aid um, person where you can reach out and ask them about it. As far as that goes, I have no idea. All right, on uh, to our next question. Uh, what would you say to someone who is afraid to get the vaccine? I would say it's, for me personally, it's fairly new. It's okay to be afraid, but don't be close-minded. Do your research, um, find out exactly what what is in the vaccine what harm it could do and what benefit you could get from it just don't be close-minded anyone else has anything to add to hesitancy on vaccine um if you have any more questions at all or um, if you're really concerned about some of the effects of the vaccine i would recommend contacting we're talking to um, your nearby pharmacist and they can provide some more information for you, like little pamphlets. And um, like Rosme mentioned, just do your research and um, do what you think is best for you, but also try to keep an open mind. And make sure you don't go on to look for those information. Uh, for the next question, we have, is it a longer program to work in a hospital, I guess, comparing to the pharmacy program? 
Um, so with the hospital, we do something. So after you graduate from your regular pharmacy school, you would have to do a residency. Now, if you want to work in the hospital, you can choose to do just a one year residency. But if you do want to specialize, it could take up to two years. Um, we are an accelerated program, which means we finish one year before um, other schools that does hold a four year program. So technically, I would say if you do go to Roosevelt and go into an accelerated program, choose to work in a hospital. Um, that's an extra year for residency on top of that. So that would still count for four years. Um, and if you go to a regular college, like school, uh, a university that has a four year program, add on the extra year would still be five. So. It's um it's just how you think about it. Um if you want to do a an accelerated program or if you would want to just um do the regular program, whichever one is best for you, not everyone can, you know, go with the fast pace of an accelerated program. I would just like to comment. I think you guys are answering these questions really well. I think we're getting some good uh clarity on some of these these key issues now. Thank you. <laughs> On to our next question. All right. So do people who have COVID-19 need a second dose? If yes, then why? I'm confused with the question a little bit. What do you mean if you have had COVID, you need a second dose? Like if you got your first dose and then you had COVID or? It seems as though the question is you got your first dose of the vaccine, then somewhere between first dose and second dose, you got COVID. And then they're just wondering whether you get the second dose when you have COVID. So you actually cannot um, be uh, or currently have COVID infection to receive um, the vaccine. So you would have to have been um, COVID free for think it's about 14 days. Um, I'd have to double check on that information for sure um, before receiving a vaccine in general. So um, if you did get a COVID um, infection in between your vaccine times, um, I'm not really sure what would happen at that current moment. Um, I don't know if research has been published about receiving the vaccine and then getting an infection in between. All right, um, next question. So was the vaccine made in a short amount of time? Okay, I can answer this one. Um, so it looks like it was made in like a very short notice almost, but technically mRNA vaccine has been researched for over decades already. Um, we just haven't had like, just think about it. If you don't have a pandemic, how would you actually put it into work and and like test it out. So when COVID came along, it was like almost like a good timing that can they, that they can actually use the mRNA vaccine because they they just been, you know, researching about it but haven't actually um using it into you know, in this case like vaccination, but it has been a research for over decades for mRNA. And they have been using it for cancer as well. So it has been a long research in terms of M, like mRNA medication wise. Okay, uh, one of our last questions. Can people who have previously had Gillian, Gillian, I'm not sure I'm saying that correctly, Gillian Bear syndrome receive a COVID-19 vaccine? So, um, patients who have previously had Guillain-Barre syndrome um, can receive the vaccine. Uh, there actually haven't been any reported cases of it with the current vaccines out. Um, nothing has been reported to the CDC yet. So, it's recommended that you get your vaccine if you can. Any more final questions? All right, I think we should all give a big round of applause to our Roosevelt Pharmacy students for the great job they did.
we really appreciate <laughs> we really appreciate you guys uh giving the presentation today i feel like we all have something valuable that we can take away and well, we all learn something new so for that this is always always very appreciated well, I also wanted to say thank you for everyone that came and join us. Um, hopefully there's um, you can um, hopefully there's important information that you can take away from this presentation. And again, um, I have sent the slide to Dr. Daly. If um, you have any questions or any concern, um, anything about um, even COVID or just Roosevelt Pharmacy School in general, all contact information is on the slide. Um, Dr. Daly, I'm more than welcome to share those with you guys. Anything else my colleague wants to add? All right. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you for having us. All right, so then this wraps up uh, the scope of pharmacy and COVID presentation. Um, I hope you guys all learned something new. Thank you very much to our presenters again. Have a good evening. Have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Everyone. Me, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. All of my uh, pharmacy presenters, thank you so much for spending some time to put this together. Um, just so you know, this is being recorded and I had several requests um, for the recording. So um, we had about 20 people show up uh, that weren't from Roosevelt, um, which is pretty good. And then many, many more people will probably get to see this. So thank you so much. No, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Daly, for basically helping me basically, you know, um, reach out to other faculties and as well as um, students around the campus to see if they're interested. Um, thank you for doing that and giving me an opportunity um, to present to everyone today. Um, I can send you the link to the recording as well, so you can have it if you want to use it for something else or, you know, if you need it. I, I don't know why you would need it, but I can send that to you as well. Thank you. That, I, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. All right. Everyone. Nice Bye, job. everyone. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye.